I supported my wife starting her own business. Then, I found out what she was selling. My wife Lisa has always had delusions of grandeur. Ever since we got married 10 years ago, she has repeatedly rejected the concept of a stable 9 to 5 job and insisted she'd make it big. Baking, digital design, writing. She latched onto whatever promise of money she could find. At first, I thought nothing of it. I mean, no one has ever become well-known for stacking cartons of milk or mopping up someone sick. Not anyone I know of anyway. So, for a long time, I supported her efforts and admired her determination, all while holding down a 9 to 5 myself. Someone had to put food on the table, after all. The arrangement worked until I was forced to resign from my construction job three years ago. At 34, my spine had finally given up and my doctor advised me to settle for milder activities. Now I couldn't exactly do office work. Years of defiance had certainly awarded me with struggles I would not have even considered in my youth. Employers took one look at the unticked box next to a high school diploma and chucked my resume in the bin. So, there I was, in my mid-thirties, having to tell my wife I could no longer work. I remember her reaction all too well. Her face scrunched up, then turned pink, then blue, until finally, she said, But Jay, how will we pay rent? Remorsefully, I told her she'd have to get a proper job. Origami, her latest obsession, ensured that every nook and cranny of the apartment was filled with stacks of multicolor paper, but didn't exactly pay the bills. Lissa didn't have an education either. So I scored the newspaper for entry-level openings. There was a restaurant down the road looking for a kitchen helper, and I presented the ad to my wife, assuring her that she'd still be able to sell her origami on the side. Her reaction was explosive. What? A kitchen helper? Who do you think I am, Jay? That'll pay nothing. I'm not touching people's dirty crap for minimum wage. I didn't have the heart to tell her that her origami business was only making a small fraction of what the ad was offering. I tried to get her to look at other openings, but she wouldn't hear of it. I'm not doing it. I have my business to think of. She kept repeating. Well, what was I supposed to do? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Inevitably, we ran out of money. No one would hire me and Lisa's origami business was only bringing in enough to cover about a third of the rent. One afternoon, my wife returned home with an expression of angst plastered onto her face. We need to talk, she wailed, slumping down on the couch and theatrically fanning her hand in front of her face. What is it? I asked, not even trying to mask my concern. What's wrong? It's, she swallowed and took a deep breath. Jay, my kidneys. They're failing. She burst into tears, nuffling her eyes. Dr. Stevens said. She sobbed. He said I have to get a, a transplant. But the waiting list is just so long. I'm going to die, Jay. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Had she just found out about this? Had she spent all morning at the doctor's office? Why hadn't she told me she was going? You're not going to die. I protested sitting down beside her and putting my arms around her quivering shoulders. I won't allow it. She glanced at me through her puffy eyes and wailed. Dr. Stevens said, he said that if I couldn't find a match. She didn't have to say it. I'd heard enough. What the hell, Lisa? You should have come to me first. Of course, I'll get tested. I'm your husband. Her face lit up. Can we go now? Please, please, can we? I couldn't tell her no. She orchestrated the car with her hands as I drove through the neighborhood until we finally pulled into a small parking lot next to a shabby-looking white building. The sign on the front read, Use Tireas, and another, Flea a Market. Lisa seemed to know what she was doing and ran up the crumbling concrete steps, beckoning to me to follow. I, uh, Lisa, this is the doctor's office. She gestured vaguely to a small rectangular sticker next to the buzzer. It read, Dr. Stevens. It's like a private ward. She explained, don't worry, you'll love him. 
I couldn't help wondering if Lisa had chosen this Dr. Stevens because he was competent or because we were strapped for cash. The premises certainly made it look as though it was the latter, and the one-eyed pigeon wandering beside the front steps made me feel all the more uneasy. We were buzzed in, and Dr. Stevens came out to meet us on the stairwell. He wore a long white lab coat and looked to be in his late fifties. Welcome, welcome. He outstretched his arms as if he was greeting long-lost grandchildren. This must be Jay. My name is Dr. Stevens, and I will be guiding you through the entire procedure. My gaze swiveled to my wife. Err, I we don't know yet if I am a match. Lisa and Dr. Stevens exchanged glances. That's not a problem. We'll run some tests. We gathered inside the small cabinet and Dr. Stevens locked the door. The place looked seedy, and I noticed an ashtray sitting on one of the white countertops. Now then, Dr. Stevens clasped his gloved hands. Let me just take a blood sample, and we'll be good to go. I stared at him. Go where? He shot me an empathetic look. We are all very concerned about your wife's well-being. Her condition is incredibly serious and may have, er, sudden complications if not treated. If you are compatible, it is vital we go through with this surgery as soon as possible. As he spoke, he jabbed my arm with a needle, making me flinch. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He seemed set on performing the surgery here and now, in this very room. Lisa, I mouthed, desperately trying to get her attention. She noticed my efforts and nodded in my direction. Yes, Jay. Dr. Stevens raised his head, obviously aware of our silent conversation, but continued working on my arm as if he hadn't noticed. I, oh, I wasn't sure how to talk to her with Dr. Stevens only inches away from my face. Maybe we should, er, reschedule. The doctor's mouth twitched, but he said nothing. Lysa's eyes filled with tears again. I have no time to wait anymore, honey. I've had this appointment scheduled for months now. Despite the heat, my skin was prickling, you knew, before today. Both Lisa and Dr. Stevens nodded in unison. She's a real fighter, your wife, he said, scrambling to his feet and depositing the blood sample on the counter. She did not wish to frighten you, but she really does not have enough time left to reschedule. Her kidneys could give out any day now. I nodded, taking it all in. Lysa was the most important person in my life, and losing her would have put my life in jeopardy. I loved her, and if keeping her around meant pushing the limits of what I was comfortable with, I'd do it. Great news. Dr. Stevens emerged from the connecting room with a smile on his face. You're a match. Lisa and I exchanged glances, and although I was relieved to see the hope in her eyes, my own blood was curdling with dread. According to Dr. Stevens, the operation had gone smoothly. I woke up from my anesthesia drenched from head to toe in a cold sweat, a parched throat, and a pounding headache. Lysa was already sitting on the edge of my bed, smiling and chatting with the doctor. Your, your, I stammered, but she hushed me and helped me up just enough to take a sip of water. Granted, I'm no expert on medicine, but I was pretty sure an organ transplant was supposed to affect both of us. I didn't want to hurt her feelings by asking why she wasn't in pain, so I thought for a bit and murmured, You're already up. Yeah. She giggled and leaned down to give me a kiss. Dr. Stevens said, I'm ready to go home. I lay there, not understanding how she was feeling so great when my entire body felt like it was being perpetually sawed in half. As soon as Lisa gave me a final hug and strutted out the front door, I turned my attention to Dr. Stevens. H. How long till I can go home? I asked, watching him light up his cigarette on the opposite side of the room. Hem. He exhaled a large cloud of smoke. I'd say, about five days. Five days. Five days of staring at the tiled ceiling and watching Dr. Stevens blow rings of smoke into the other. But... He tapped his cigarette on the side of the ashtray. There is a caveat. I tensed up and immediately felt the stitches in my back protesting. What? Are you a smoker, Jay? He asked, casually suckling on the filter of his cigarette. 
I contemplated my answer. On the one hand, Dr. Stevens was a doctor and likely knew the answer already. On the other hand, I certainly wasn't a heavy smoker. I'd have the odd cigarette here and there, but was certainly not partaking at the level I used to in my twenties. Yes, I said realizing too late that it came out more like a question than an answer. Not wanting him to take it as a given, I added. I mean, I used to. Well, he sighed. It seems like your lousy habit has caught up with you. Well, your lungs, to be exact. My lungs. I croaked. What about them? Dr. Stevens was silent for a moment as if he was thinking long and hard about what he was going to say. There's a tumor on your right lung. He finally said, it's rather large and, I'm very sorry to say, cancerous. He barked the last word as if it were a jack-in-the-box, and I recoiled, my heart thumping in my throat. Well, see, can it be removed? I believe it would be in your best interest if we remove the offending lung altogether. He said, matter-of-factly, we wouldn't want the cancer to spread. Does my wife know about this? Oh, yes. He waved his hand dismissively. I gave her the heads up before he woke up. I mulled over his words. If Lisa was aware of my diagnosis, why was she so chipper just before she left? And wasn't telling my wife first, a breach of doctor-patient confidentiality. So, what do you say? Dr. Stevens put out his cigarette, up for another little op. I stared at him in bewilderment. Little op, who the fuck did this guy think he was? Alarms blared in my brain warning me to get up and get out, but I couldn't. My back ached, as if it had been broken in several places at once, and soon enough, Dr. Stevens approached the bed to administer a painkiller. Take this, he said. It'll make you feel better. I examined the little white pill in his hands, but there was no way I was going to take anything else he gave me. I let him place the pill onto my tongue and pretended to swallow until he retreated to his ashtray. Oh, and think on that operation, he smirked. Lighting up, wouldn't want you to suffer the same fate as your wife. I wondered what the hell Lisa was thinking, choosing a doctor like this. There was no way I was about to spend the next few days under the knife, trusting Dr. Stevens to carve out parts of my body, one after the other. To his astonishment, I shoved the covers away and made my way towards the door through gritted teeth. No, thank you. I spat. I'll take my chances. I didn't have any spare change for a cab, so I had to walk. It wasn't that far, maybe ten blocks, but my back pain was quickly permeating throughout the rest of my body. I stormed in the front door of our apartment and found Lisa kneeling on the floor, surrounded by neat little piles of cash. What's this? I demanded, glaring at her. She obviously hadn't been expecting me and had sprawled out awkwardly over the money, mumbling something under her breath. What is that? I asked again, edging closer to her. It's... Her cheeks were flushed, and her eyes were too busy darting back and forth to meet mine. Lisa. Suddenly, the crease in her forehead cleared, and her eyes flashed. Honey, it's our lucky day. We've won the lottery. The lottery. We don't play the lottery. I, I bought a ticket on the way home after the surgery, she gabbled. I felt lucky. And look, now we have enough to last us months and months. I stared at the piles of money strewn across the floor. There must have been tens of thousands. No, hundreds of thousands. I swallowed. How much did we win? She swept the stray bills into a little pile with her hands and looked up at me. Three hundred thousand. Now, in any other circumstance I would have jumped for joy. $300,000 was a ridiculous amount of money. However, something about my wife didn't seem quite right. It almost seemed as though she wasn't being entirely truthful. Aren't you happy? She asked, wide-eyed, we're rich. I took a step forward, and she recoiled instantly. Jay, honey, her voice quivered. What were you doing wandering around town? buying lottery tickets while I was in a hospital bed, recovering from your transplant. She flinched. I just, I just. You just what? I had to walk all the way home because you weren't there to pick me up, for God's sake. 
Hours after a vital organ was ripped out of me by that sicko doctor. I'm sorry, Jay. I was just going to. But I wasn't remotely interested in anything she had to say. Show me your back. She stared at me. What? I said, show me your back. And then louder, I added. Now. She resisted. But even through my pain, I managed to wrestle her to the ground and pull up her shirt. The skin on her back was perfectly smooth. Not a single scratch, incision, or stitch in sight. Okay, okay. She wailed. I sold it. Look at us, Jay. We're broke. We barely have enough change to buy flour, for God's sake. We needed the money, and... Don't tell him anything. A voice behind us interjected. Are you crazy? I looked up, and there he was again. Dr. Stevens, towering above us, a grim expression on his face. What the... I started, but he cut me off. Lisa, go pack your things. God knows what else you've said. We can't stay here anymore. My wife shot me an apologetic look, but Dr. Stevens ushered her out of the room. I, I, don't understand. My voice was panicked. Why are you here? Where are you taking her? He chuckled. Oh, I assure you I'm not taking her anywhere. She's pretty happy to come along. I felt my world crumbling around me. This man. And my wife. I couldn't bear it. With clenched fists, I charged at Dr. Stevens, but I was too weak. He stepped aside, and I smashed headfirst into the glass cabinet. Everything went dark. I awoke in a white hospital bed. My first thought was not again. But when I managed to turn my head, I noticed that this ward was far bigger and brighter than Dr. Stevens' crummy cabinet. There wasn't a single ashtray in sight, and the room smelled of antiseptic and soap. I can't tell you what happened to Lisa and Dr. Stevens. I can't tell you, because I don't know. That was the last time I ever saw them. All I know is that my wife, the high flyer she is, has certainly managed to achieve her lifelong dream of running her own business. I wish I could go find her and tell her what I think of her little scheme. I wish I could go and make Dr. Stevens repent for his crimes. I wish I could, and I undoubtedly would if she hadn't sold my legs.